Okay. So hello everybody. Uh, welcome to this, the Harley Gallery third uh, virtual gallery talk. Today, I'm really delighted to welcome Hannah Marples to speak to us. And as well as working here at the Portland Collection as one of our gallery coordinators, Hannah, in her other life, is a historic costume interpreter. Interpreter. She's been seen on BBC television's A Stitch in Time. She's made costumes for the Newark Civil War Museum, the Royal Armouries in Leeds, for reenactors, and also for film and television. Uh, it's been so interesting to hear Hannah look at some of the really lovely historic portraits currently on display in the Portland collection. And I hope you enjoy um, her discussion about the paintings as much as I did. She's going to be talking for around 20 minutes and then there'll be time for questions and answers. Uh, if you want to send questions to me uh, via the chat bar, I'll try and get through them. So right now, if you're ready, Hannah, over to you and thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Lisa, that was lovely. Um, so as I said, I'm going to discuss um, some of the portraits, particularly of the 17th century. I'm going to focus on William Cavendish, first Duke of Newcastle and his second wife, Margaret Lucas. Um, before I delve into that though, I'm just going to give a little background into my work just so that you know where I'm coming from. So I studied um, costume with textiles at Huddersfield University um, and I sort of fell into historical costume in our first year where we did a Victorian bodice which you can see in the first image there. Um, and then the image in the middle was from my third year placement year filming a stitch in time. And then the last image there is after I graduated, when I started really sort of branching out freelancing and um, that was based on the rainbow portrait um, of Elizabeth I for a film. So let's get started. I started actually at the Portland Collection just over a year ago, um, which has actually really helped me practice my slow looking, which is sort of the art of analysing um, pieces, portraits, that sort of thing. Um, and I can tell you I've had many arguments with myself over the paintings we're going to see today. So we're going to start with William Cavendish, first Duke of Newcastle, painted by Sir Anthony Van Dyke, uh, 1636 to 7. So I love this image, to be honest, because it is just subtle, you know? A lot of the early 17th century costumes were very lavish, heavily embroidered, decorated, paint, you know, lavish silks and things, but this is a more subtle, expensive, you know, he didn't need to sort of show his wealth, he already had it. Um, so I'm going to start by his undergarments first and sort of guessing what he had underneath this outfit if it did actually exist and then we'll work our way out and then we'll start from top to bottom. So as you can see just peeking through the sleeves there um, through his doublet sleeves is his linen shirt. Um, you wore your linens closest to your skin because it kept you um, from smelling and it was easier to launder and linen was sort of um, cheaper but more durable. You could get really expensive linens but equally you wanted something um, that you could easily replace closest to your skin that would have the most wear and tear. You know you're constantly doing up your britches, your doublet over your, your linens so you need it to be easily replaced or mended like with darning, things like that. As you can see because of the tuft coming out of his, his doublet sleeve it's a very wide sleeved shirt. Um, common for the period, very fashionable, and it was actually throughout history, medieval through to Victorian, men wore heavily sleeved shirts. So then we move on to his doublet, which is slightly undone at the stomach there, and you can just see on his right, his waistline. Now that's very high on modern, you know, standards. Men like to wear their trousers sort of lower down nowadays, but in the 17th century, particularly during the 1630s, the waistline grew higher and higher for men, um, almost ridiculously cropped, like a crop top. And then you see his skirts, what's called um, at the bottom of his doublet, which were flaps that lifted up. And underneath at the waistline, the very 
high waistline. He had either a lacing strip or a hooking strip, which is basically a heavy linen canvas, probably, that was what most of them were made of. And you actually attached your britches to your doublet so that if you were riding or walking or whatever, your doublet wouldn't ride up and your trousers wouldn't fall down. So it was like a sort of historical onesie and you could exit the entire ensemble in one go without having to unhook them all. So that was really helpful. You can see a slight in the centre there, centre from his buttons. They seem to be in pairs rather than equally spaced all the way down. That's of course a fashionable thing. Um, buttons were extremely expensive really for what we see them as today. These were probably silk wrapped buttons. So if I just click here, this is a set of silk wrapped buttons that I made for my final project at uni. Um, they take about five minutes to make, but they are basically a wooden core with silk thread wrapped around them. And you could get loads of different patterns, loads of different colours. And of course, you could even have them made in gold or silver thread and actual gold or silver, not just the colour. So I assume as well that his sleeves, where they are slashed and pained down the, the centre there, I'd assume that there'd be buttons there too just in case he wanted to do them up but of course a lot of the time during the 17th century buttonholes were and buttons were decorative and sometimes they didn't actually work at all they were just there for the sake of being there and his sleeves actually are fashionable of the time they're not as pained as other 17th century um, men's sleeves but of course they're still fashionable nonetheless um, and then we move on to his sash. Now, when I first got into the gallery and saw the sash, I was so excited because I thought this was a changeable taffeta silk sash until I started looking into it. And I had a conversation with the curator actually, and she told me that originally when William was the Knight of Bath, um, the sash was red and then when he was made the Order of the Garter in 1661 the painting was actually updated to show a blue sash and then over time this is just what's happened to the painting and this is how the colours have reacted with each other but actually if it was changeable taffeta that would be like oh that's so exciting <laughs> but obviously it's not so never mind <laughs> so then we move on to his cloak his outerwear now this is where I've argued with myself a lot because it was extremely fashionable for men to have an all-in-one matching suit, doublet, Venetian hose, you know, cloak, everything out of the same fabric. But because of the slight difference of texture, I don't know whether this is a very finely milled wool. Um, and with it being his outerwear, it would make sense if it was wool because wool was sort of more waterproof, you could have it as fine as silk, you know, it could be as expensive as silk in some cases. Um, but that is one thing I'm unsure of, but hey ho, uh, I, and assume it was lined with silk, so there'd be silk there somewhere. And then just moving on to his one singular glove that you can see there, it was probably made of kid leather, there's sort of no decorative um, thing on the glove, his cuff was attached to his shirt, um, but probably removable so that the shirt and the cuff could be laundered separately, much like his collar, which probably was made out of a really fine, expensive linen, because uh, as you can see, it's slightly um, shiny, which means there was more of a production in the manufacture into making it that so. Um, and it was probably tied to the shirt at the back, or at the front, you can just see his ties poking out under his little goatee beard there, um, which is really exciting. And obviously the, the lace is really deep set and there was lots of different imagery that people wanted in their lace to show family things or stories or their status. So we're going to move down now um, to his hose and his hat. Um, it looks like as if it's a wide brimmed, what they called a beaver hat, which sort of was an umbrella term for loads of different hats in the 17th century and uh, made popular by Charles and you can see his hose I'm calling them hose because I've described these as Venetian hose um, or his britches 
there was you know like much like the waistline a lot of the britches rose up towards you know the upper thigh area whereas William's actually keeping it quite modest and keeping it knee length uh, with his garter there and his um, roses around his knees probably to tie the britches at the knee and then keep his stockings up as well you can also see the bottom of the tab there of the um, doublet that's just lined um, lined which is lace uh, just a narrow sort of braid there um, the narrow of the lace it more suggests that it was locally made rather than imported from france or spain um, the sort of more fashionable silks and laces were brought in from Spain and France but if you had a narrow um, lace or trim it sort of suggested it was more your everyday wear and also it was more sort of locally made. So then we move on to his shoes and his stockings. Now Van Dyck is actually credited to being the first sort of artist that shows the wrinkles in your stockings. Um, I don't know why but apparently he is um, so we'd assumed that his stockings were silk knitted this also meant they had a bit of stretch in them because of the the way they were knitted um, and silk stocking knitted knitted silk stockings were becoming more and more popular in England and the production in this country was booming really it was really you know taking off and then you can see his shoe roses. They could be as expensive as a month's wage for some people. And they were often decorated with laces and spangles, which were the, what we know as sequins today, but spangles could be made out of gold or silver. So they were really expensive. And you can just see the heel on his shoe there as well. So then we move on to Margaret, his second wife. So this portrait was by Peter Lely from 1665 and it was probably painted for the ceremony of William's dukedom so she's actually in her sort of court dress here. Um, you can see her hat, apparently Samuel Pepys always used to look forward to Margaret's appearances in court and um, she always wore this hat apparently, her velvet cap with her plumes and her panache, um, probably ostrich feathers, some of them dyed, some of them not. Um, and in one account, somebody says that, um, I can't remember who it was or even when, but a lot of the time the uh, plumes were decorated with spangles as well. Now I do have an image that's going to pop up, here we go, um, of this little image is a little detail of Charles as a young boy by Van Dyck and you can sort of just see a slight texture on the feathers there on his panache and it suggested that they are spangles because in armour ceremonial um, dress because this was for a sort of a parade that they would have spangles in their panaches so that it would glimmer in battle and sort of blind their opponent with their wealth and their status and of course Charles being Charles he was very important so it's wondering whether Margaret indeed had spangles as well so then we move on to her neckline she would have had a smock or a chemise underneath probably linen again again to be laundered and um, but you can't see that there's no sort of suggestion apart from on her cuffs um, and then you can really see the oval neckline taking off in the 17th century. This was really popular during the 1660s. And you can see the border lace there around the top of the neckline and down the front of the bodice as well and down her sleeves. Um, I had a discussion with a lady in the gallery actually who was a lace maker and she sort of suggested that the lace was made out of silver thread and that's why it's got that metallic quality. Um, and there are still some extant garments with um, metallic lace as well. Now, as you can see, she's got her mantle there. The number of ermine tails suggested her status so that when she was in court, her status was always worn. You know, people could see who she was. And this is actually quite a pared down outfit for Margaret, I think, because she was often credited for having the most outrageous clothing. She often designed her own clothes. Samuel Pepys again said, you know, how he looked forward to having her at court because she was a spectacle. You know, people liked to look at her. She was a trendsetter. And actually, she used to make her, her um, men that used to travel with her, her foot guards and that, 
they used to match their outfits to her or she used to have them match and um, so often they would be seen in velvet which was highly unlikely for these sorts of people because it just wasn't really that practical so then we move down and um, you can see the point of her bodice there the silhouette overall sort of reminds me of 1540s fashion with sort of lowering the waistline of women and sort of getting a more masculine approach and there was a quote um in the 1660s where the, the gender sort of gap was sort of failing in the sense that men were dressing like women and women were dressing more like men and sort of lo losing the curvature that they'd adopted in earlier 1600s and as you can see on her petticoat her silver lace is on there as well which is really lovely and i'd like to suggest that it's made out of cloth of silver purely because of the way that it's painted and because it's you know a ceremony that she's there for um but however it probably wasn't cloth of silver all the way around her petticoat it was probably just the front half and then the the back half was probably made of a cheaper fabric probably silk or you know a very expensive linen is so still expensive but much less expensive than the cloth of silver it's also safe to assume that she had a bum roll underneath all these skirts just to keep her, her skirt pleats upwards and also to emphasize her smaller waist and then the drapery of the velvet of the overskirt and you can just see there as well that the mantle is lined with the fur as well and then that's just an image to show you that the skirt at the bottom was also bordered with the lace and um, which is very exciting so then this is Lucy Percy, just to show a contrast of the eras, you know, the, the amount of silhouettes that we've got going on. So Margaret was 1660s, we're now back into the 1630s with Lucy. Um, just look at those sleeves, like, oh my God. So the sleeves would have been made entirely separately to the cuff. You can just see the scalloped cuff there that's in the detailed image and the bodice and then it would have been gathered and then whipped into the bodice or the cuff and um, so that each section was a complete item on its own she would have had much like margaret which i forgot to mention her bodice was probably the support system so earlier in sort of elizabethan times we had what we call bodies and then later in the sort of 18th century we move on to stays so it's like their corsets of the time their structural undergarments but during the 17th century because of these swooping necklines which were also mirrored in the back it was easier for garments to have their own um, structure within the bodice itself rather than having two separate garments which also meant that the bodices were probably laced at the back which it's quite sad that nobody's really painted from the back because it would really reveal more constructive things and clues as to how these garments were made and as you can see with the painting as well um of the the silk there it's really sort of lovely thick taffeta it's really thick silk there with the creases and it's safe to say that her smock is the the so stability of her sleeves look how wide the linen is of her smock that's just poking through the pain sleeves these sleeves are actually reminiscent of the men's sleeves that i was on about earlier with the massive pains you could have more or less pains depending on who you were your fabrics and things like that it's also safe to assume that with a gown like this that it would have been pieced in the sense that fabrics only came at a certain width and then so with these massive skirts like what Lucy Percy is wearing they had to add these triangles in to sort of fill out the skirt there um, just to sort of make more of the fabric it also meant that you could be more clever with um, wastage you didn't have to waste as much fabric that was so expensive um, but often in portraits you don't see it and often in actually real life when you make them and you piece these things you don't actually see the seams at all which is completely bonkers in modern day life you want everything in one complete thing but when you're pleated in massive skirt like this you don't actually see the seams so as well you can just see the pearls there which were very common in that time as well 
and her shawl. These sorts of exotic fabrics that women drape themselves in were often um, sort of either provided by the drapery artist or the artist themselves. It was sort of a costume that they'd wear to sort of suggest their status and you know exoticness and look how well travelled I am. So that is everything I have to say. I've whizzed through that, blimey. I didn't realise I'd get through it that quickly. <laughs> Hannah, thank you so much. In fact, you are absolutely bob on uh, at 19 and a half minutes. Thank oh, you so very much. <laughs> that was re really great. And I hope uh, other people found it as um, illuminating as I did. We've got one question up already from Carrie Young. And Carrie asks whether you know how many dressmakers might have been involved in making each of these outfits. Ooh. I'm not sure to be honest without actually seeing the actual counts themselves um, I know sort of through other accounts of other garments that we have um, well we don't have anymore but looking at past accounts from Welbeck and things that you know they had a, a shoemaker a linen maker um, like a collar mm -hmm. maker so each garment had their own sort of maker um, and actually a lot of the accounts that I've seen from William Cavendish in particular um, a lot of the things were locally sourced and especially for his staff and things they they were from workshop a lot of the tailors and things so okay thank you now I have actually uh, unmuted everyone I can so feel free to put your hands up and speak but before that, I've got a question. Well, I've got two questions here. Uh, Susan has asked whether you could talk a bit more about Margaret's underclothes. And then a second question is from Freya, who's nine. And she wants to know, Hannah, if blue was particularly popular as a colour, because both of the women in the portraits are wearing blue dresses. Absolutely. So Margaret's undergarments, I'm going to whiz back to Margaret just so we can see her bodice there. So likewise with um, Lucy Percy's gown, her bodice would have probably <coughs> been stiffened. The lining would have probably had the boning um, and the stiffened linens or buckrams um, that would create the stiff flat front, back, uh, front there. And again, it would probably be laced at the back. Um, the boning was probably whalebone um, and a, a mixture of that and dried reeds, which were called bents, um, which, you know, singularly you can snap them, but as a row of, they, they are really, um, they're really, they're really structural. Um, and there's loads of examples of accounts and extant garments of previous uh, centuries as well, where they've been used but judging by Margaret's status it was probably more whale bones and the linen, the lining sorry was probably housing all the structural elements so then the top expensive fabric could just be smoothed on and sort of um you know sort of placed on more romantically rather than having to follow the structural seams of the inner linings um and yes, blue was quite popular in the sense of um, fashions. I think as well, it's down to the artist as well, actually. Um, I know, is it Peter Laney, probably? Yeah. Um, he, there's also a portrait of Queen Henrietta Maria, who is in a very similar gown to Lucy Percy. Um, so his, you know, it was apparently a very romanticised um, outfit. To sort of show purity and this romantic image of sort of like a fairy tale sort of you know lady um, but yeah blue was quite popular in the sense that it was expensive to produce and um, so the sort of higher statuses wore blue and um, so certainly in portraits people wanted to be painted in blacks blues things like that to really show their status um, likewise with William wearing black, it's said that Charles's inner circle, they have portraits painted in black to show their support to the king and to show their sort of friendships with the king as well, not just that they are really good supporters of him. Thank you. 
Now, um, somebody has asked uh, a question asking whether there are any historical costumes held here in the Fort Collection. Unfortunately, we don't have any uh, here. There were some uh, 19th, early 20th century um, um, dresses, uh, which, but they are now at the Bath Costume Museum. I've certainly getting loads of comments, Hannah, saying what a fascinating and lovely talk it is. And mm -hmm. other people are asking uh, where else, where they might find some more information. Do you have some uh, book recommendations or any other resources that people might go to to learn a bit more? Absolutely. So um, a new favourite book of mine actually is called Stuart Style, Monarchy Dress and the Scottish Male Elite by Maria Haywood. Mm -hmm. um, she actually mentions not only William Cavendish, uh, King Charles obviously and she does actually mention William Bentinck who's uh, in the gallery as well um, as well as Charles's executioneering which we have in the gallery so that's obviously a firm favourite um, and then the books by Nora Woe she does the cut of women's clothes 1600 onwards <coughs> and the cut of men's clothes 1600 onwards and she really is credited with noting all the accounts and things that she can find that back up you know arguments as to why people dress the way they did through you know the eras not just tailors accounts but financial accounts so you can see how much things cost to make uh, depending on fabrics and she's also um, provides patterns that were images of patterns that were used in the centuries as well so they're really helpful okay. What I might do, everybody, I might ask Hannah if she can uh, perhaps provide a, a sort of uh, additional reading list and we'll put that up on the website so you don't need to take notes now. And also Rebecca Arles has mentioned a writer called Sarah Bendel who has a blog with a lot of information on it. So you might want to check out Sarah Bendel's uh, blog. And then finally, I've got one more question and uh, Somebody uh, has asked about the curtain and the drapery in Margaret's portrait and she's asking whether, Hannah, you think that was a further uh, reflection of Margaret's status? Absolutely. Um, sometimes the sort of backdrops were very theatrical in sort of emphasising status and symbols, you know, who knows if these backgrounds actually existed. It was down to the sitter and the artist. Um, but the way that the that drapery is painted and the fringing, I mean the fringing alone is amazing. But the the because the curtain is sort of painted similarly to her petticoat, which is cloth of silver, it's safe to assume that it would have been cloth of gold, um, which would again show her symbol uh, to her status. So, thank you. Well, that's taken us to twelve thirty, and at the end of the talk, I. Think I think uh, we've got another thanks very interesting Hannah and it has been really great it's wonderful to have you as a member of staff and to have all of that body of a particular knowledge so when we're open again and we really do hope it will be soon do come and visit if Hannah's around I know she'll be happy to talk to you about any of the portraits on display everybody thank you very very much thank you, very thank you Hannah thank you. And hopefully we look forward to see you again in the new year. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>